Usually that's kind of scary because these could be complicated. General equilibrium models, and it's called GE models, are these usually very sort of large crafted models where you take these different individual actors that we've been looking at one, one at a time and put them together into the same model on the same market economy and look at how they um, interact with one another. So sort of like a model of the entire economy. We look at a, um, a, a simple version of a GE model, which is referred to as an exchange economy. And as it sounds, uh, what happens here is just trade or exchange of products, uh, no production. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up a model of an exchange economy using these consumer problems we've talked about and look at um, trade between consumers. So what I'm interested in here is using this, this GE model to study uh, trade between consumers. And some of the bigger GE models, you can also have firms and producers, even hiring labor, paying income, consumer then buys products, company produces, profits are made, and so on. This is easier. This is just you have trade between consumers that have, call it an endowment of goods. And what we want to look at is look at the, the outcome um, of the trade. So we'll sort of see what happens when these individuals are allowed to trade between one another and then look at the outcome. We'll talk a little bit about some criteria or qualities of the outcome, efficient, inefficient, that kind of thing. So those bigger questions will come later. Uh, let's just sort of build the framework here so we have something to work with. Mm -hmm. So for my exchange, who's there a question? So for my exchange economy, I have in mind a population of consumers. I'm going to write all the math down in a second. And each consumer has some endowment of products and services. And then we're going to bring them together, like in a marketplace, and let them trade with one another. So in a nutshell, it's sort of an individual consumer A, consumer B, can get together and trade products with one another. So to start with, what we're going to do is do an exchange economy with uh, no prices. So when I'm talking about trading products with each other, it's sort of like a barter. Just imagine we did this as a kid, right? Like after Halloween, let's get candy, trade with your friends for other candy, that kind of thing. Of course, Unfortunately, right, sometimes you do have the domestic or national currency will collapse in a country and everybody loses faith in the, the currency and resorts to this, right? So if you're growing chickens at your house, take all your chickens down to the market and barter with people to get pencils, right. milk, rice, whatever you need, right? Why do you have to do all this? I mean, you have to do all the barter because you say, you know, one chicken is worth what when you're talking about milk? Who the hell knows? So you got to figure it out because there's no prices and no money. So very inefficient. But you do have cases where that whole thing collapses and you have to resort to money. That's what I have in mind here. I'm just going to model that uh, between my individuals. So um, to, to keep things simple, Simplify. When I talk about this economy full of consumers, like millions of them and millions of different products, I don't want to graph all that. So I'm going to make it easier and assume that my population of consumers consists of, you want to guess? Two. No. Two people. I know that seems absurd. <laughs> But it makes for a two-dimensional graph, which is real easy on the professor later then. All right, so two people. We could give them a name, like call first one A and the second one. How's that? 
All right, so we've taken millions of people, and now we only have two people, just to make it easy. And now we have millions of types of products, right? Grapes, chickens, milk, computers, barbed wire fence, pencils. We're going to make that easier, too, and assume there's only how many types of goods? Boom, two. I would say there's two types of goods. Any guesses? X-rays and yellow prints. All right, X and Y. So I have my two people, I'm gonna have two types of goods, and that'll be my exchange economy. It turns out I know it seems simple, but you can go a long ways just with that. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take each consumer and assume there's some sort of endowment in the economy. That is, since I don't have any production here because I don't want firms and companies, I just want A and B to each start with a certain amount of what? X and Y. So somehow they got a hold of it. So the endowment looks something like this. A has a basket of goods, I'll live like X, A, and Y, A. And we'll, we can do specific numbers here in a second. So that's the basket for A. Just to emphasize the fact that it's like the starting basket, you could do something like call this X hat Y hat. B also has a basket. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same basket. So we'll call B's basket X, B, Y, B. And that's their endowment. How about as I do this, I'll put an example right next to it. So we have numbers. Sometimes if you see numbers, it makes it a little bit more transparent. But you don't need these specific numbers, right? So this just be one example. So you could say, for example, A has, how about uh, 40 units of X and uh, 10 units of Y would be and B maybe has 25 units of X and uh, 50 units of Y, something like that. Okay, so you just pick some numbers. All right, so as far as uh, the economy here, what I can do is go from household to household and document how much of a specific type of good they have. This will be pretty easy in this economy because you only have to have two houses and calculate the total amount of X and Y available in the economy, right? So in terms of my economy, the total endowment, if I take X, A hat, then I go to the next household, which is B, do that. If we had household C, keep going. You only have two households. You can add those up and get what we'll call X bar. X bar being in the economy right now, there's only this many chickens and brands. So, okay, so right here, if I look at X bar in my example, X bar looks like it would be what? So if we add up the total X in this example economy, X bar is 65, right? 65 units of X. You do the same thing for Y. So you go household to household, I'm just kind of Doing my accounting. Yes, sir. Anybody major in accounting? So I do the same thing for Y. And I get that, call that Y bar. So in my example in this economy that I made up, I just made up these numbers, of course. Oh, Looks like I have 60 of them. All right, usually what you also have is some sort of representation of consumer preference. So you take A, you take B, and you have preference ordering over baskets, which we usually represent just with the utility function. So in my economy, you don't always have to have one specific type of utility function or preferences, but in this one, let's say that we have for consumer A for preferences, Consumer A has some sort of utility function. And consumer B has a utility function. 
right? And these utility functions can vary. For my example, I can make them cop that looks. So maybe like UA equals, I would just XA times YA. And UB equals XB times YB. Would be one example. But you could do perfect substitutes or whatever. All right, so those are actually all the ingredients I need. Got my endowment. You can calculate total amount of X and Y that's feasible in the economy. I have some sort of representation of preferences over these baskets. And then what I want to do is look at the opportunity for A and B in trade. Okay, so for trade here, uh, usually trades uh, um, organized using prices, which you can fold into this model. Let's start with we're not going to have prices. And just imagine sort of bargaining, uh, not bargaining, was it bartering? Bartering between A and B. So what are we looking for here? What are we looking for with trade? We're looking for gains from trade. Gains from trade. We can find gains from trade, then there should be trade. So what do I mean? Here's what I mean. So if I take my endowment, so for A, the endowment was Let's use those example, those numbers we had. We had uh, 4010. To get a, a sort of a starting point, a benchmark, if you will, before trade begins, A can sort of look at what they have and calculate how well off they are. Which is useful because if A is going to engage in trade with B, a should never accept a trade that results in a new basket that makes them worse off than where they started. Otherwise, what's the point? So what I could do is from my benchmark, right, I could take the utility that A gets if they just take that basket of goods they're endowed with and consume that, right? So if I have 40 units of X, 10 units of Y, my utility from that basket is, what is that? X times Y, right? So 400 would be A's utility. You do the same thing with B, right? Uh, what did B have? It's the 2550 right here, right? So that was B's starting point. Um, so for B here, the beginning, right, benchmark is you have 25 units of X and 50 units of Y. So that's 25 times 50. Well, 50, there we go. Right, so I'm not really comparing A and B. I'm not trying to compare who's better off or anything like this. The point of doing this is to use this as a way to see whether A and B would accept a trade. Well, what do I mean by a trade? A trade is just A says, I'll give you some of this, you give me some of uh, that. Right? When I'm looking for gains from trade, what I'm trying to do is then can I find a trade between A and B where they exchange products and both their utilities go what? Uh, so if I could trade X and Y between A and B, and then afterwards the utility for A and the utility for B both go up, uh, then that would make a... Uh, an exciting trade, something that goes like. 
you get gains on both ends. If there's a trade that we come up with that makes A better off, like let's get greedy. What could A say if A got really greedy? A could just say to B, give me everything you have. So then A has what? How much X? 40. So I have 40, but if the trade takes place, right? A says to B, give me everything you have. Do you guys have a, like a younger brother or sister? So you give me all your candy. Yes. So then A has 65 units of X and 60 units of Y until mom finds out that now A doesn't have any candy. Then A's utility is going to go what? And B's utility is going to go, you know. So that's not an acceptable trade, right? B would never voluntarily go into that. Right? Let's be some sort of violence. Threats. All right, so for acceptable trades, I have to make both people better off. Cobb Douglas usually tends to celebrate balanced baskets. Because if you get imbalanced baskets, the margin rates of substitution tend to be kind of extreme, really high or really low. So if you look at this, right, I sort of cook these numbers a little bit. Well, not the cook's not the right. But I pick numbers here so that you can see it looks like A is a little bit heavy on the X, light on the Y, and I made B a little bit the opposite, right? a little bit lighter on the X, kind of heavy on the Y. So how about we consider a trade like this? A gives B one unit of X in exchange for one unit of Y. Okay, there's a, a possible trade we could investigate. All right, and it should be uh, interesting as long as it boosts both A and B's utility. Will it? I have no idea. But we should be able to figure it out, right? So let's check whether we get these gains from trade on both sides. All right, so if I can raise utilities, then it's interesting. <laughs> All right, here we go. Suppose the trade is accepted, hypothetical, right? So A is checking her, her utility, right? Am I going to be better off after this trade? So after the trade, I'd have how many units of X? 39. 39. So my utility is going to be just X times Y, right, Cobb Douglas? Yeah. So 39 times the amount of Y that I have after the trade, which would be... Nine, 10, 11. 11, right? So I gave away one unit of X and I got one additional unit of Y. All right, so there would be your new basket. So what I'm going to check is just what the utility of that is. So 39 times 11 is 429. What does that mean? Good news or bad news? Good news for A. Good news for A so far, so good, right? That would boost A's utility, right? A had a utility of what? 400, 429 is definitely better. Higher in difference curve. So now let's check for B. After the trade, B no longer has 2550. What do they have? 2649. 2649, exactly. Right. So 26 units of X, 49 units of Y. And so I'm going to plug that in the utility function and see where I'm at. 1274. 1274 it is, which is also good news or bad news? Yes. Good news, right? 1274 is higher than 1250, right? So the utility goes up from here to here. So what did we do? We moved around X and Y in the economy, right? We took something away from one person, gave it to someone else, and did the opposite. And the utility, right, for both consumers went up. So this is this is not zero sum, right? This is like win-win. So there's my gains from trade right there. Right? Both consumers are better off.
It's almost, this is sort of relatively speedy because we're in a microeconomics class, but it's almost kind of exciting. <laughs> Magic. That's why those people take the chickens down to the market, right? Trade them for what we said. Milk, pencils, create a new basket. And when everybody walks home from the market at the end of the day, everyone's happy. We're better off. So you got to be thinking, well, if that worked once, why don't we try it again? Or why stop here? Is it possible uh, we can make them even better off yet? We can do this real fast. Let's try it one more time. One more time. Think it'll work? What would UA be? Let's do the same trade. Just see what happens. So how much X and Y would A have? 38. 12. And what would B have? Uh, 2750. Oh, no, 27, 48, 49. 48, yeah. Oh, 48. See, so, yeah, that's going down. All right, so we'll drop that calculator, see what happens. See if the excitement continues. 38 times 20. 456. Oh, my God. Look at that. 27 times 48. Cross your fingers. 12, 96. 12, oh, my goodness. Look at this. You guys ever experienced like anything like this in your other classes? <laughs> so it, it went up again. Should we try again? Well, it was going to take forever. Right? It turns out you keep going and going and going up to a point. Eventually, this is going to stop. I'll show you how it looks when it stops. But eventually, it will stop. What will stop? Uh, a case where trades lead to improvement and utility for both people. That is, you're going to get to a point, if you keep doing this all night long, where if you try to make A better off, like we've been doing, the only way you can do it is by what? Making B, Making worse. B worse off. And once you get to that point, what happens to trade? It stops. Because anything A proposes to try to make yourself better off, B says, well, that would make me worse than So B says no, B says no, B says no. And so trade will stop at a certain point. If we can get to that point, though, they have an A for it. They call it the Pareto efficient allocation. And the definition is, definition of a Pareto efficient allocation is in order to make someone better off, you have to make someone else worse than it's efficient, right? Because um, it's the opposite of what's going on here, right? So what I'm trying to get at here um, is uh, where will trade stop? All right, and it turns out it'll stop at a Pareto efficient allocation. They call these P allocations. All right, we can find them. We don't have to do this sort of a repetitive one X or one Y kind of thing. All right, so in order to show you these, uh, what I need to do is add a little bit more into my model here. So a little bit more uh, structure framework. And so in order to show you uh, nicely, what I'm going to do is introduce what's called an edge worth box, which is a, a commonly used as a model to represent exchange economies. There are all kinds of names here. Pareto and Edgeworth are famous economies. One day they'll be a fantastic one. You guys heard of the Edgeworth box before? You see the movie Edgeworth Box? There's no. <laughs> All right, here's how it looks. So this Edgeworth Box is uh, is genius. As long as you have two people and two types of goods, it works great. What it is is it's sort of a, once you can sort of become comfortable with it, it's a nice illustration of 
what allocations are feasible and how good they are. So instead of all the math and the stories, you can just look at one picture and hopefully it sort of all becomes illuminating. All right, so here's how it works. It's gonna look like uh, a box, of course. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna put X on the horizontal axis and Y on the vertical axis. So this is one of our favorite quadrants. And what I'm gonna do to start with is I'm gonna go out here all the way to X bar. Remember X bar? That was the total amount of X in the economy. So X bar is like right here. So it would be the dimensions on my box. So X bar, I think in the example was what? 65. Okay. okay, so it's just the total size of the X economy. And then on the Y, you do something similar, right? Go all the way up to Y bar. So if you have numbers given for the endowment, Y bar was 60, I think, right here. All right, so far so good. And then just make the box. Box like this, okay? Now, of course, there's more to it than that, right? Because how could this guy be famous if that's what he did? Good. So what did he do? All right, so what he does is use this box here to model allocations and trade between A and B. So you got a little bit creative. First step's easy, second step's a little bit creative. So familiar or not? So what he does is he puts one consumer over here without loss of generality. We'll assign this corner to A, Andrew. So A is looking at the world like this, right? Just to emphasize this, I know it's obvious, but here's A, right? X-axis, Y-axis. That what we're comfortable with. And what I can do is uh, I can plot A's, what does A have? A has an endowment in the box. So if you go back to the example here, right? A had 40 units of X and 10 units of Y. So it's just a coordinate point. So where's that? Um, so that's like right about here, right? 40 and 10, more or less. So this is what X A had and Y A had. Okay, so far so good. Again, still not even that impressive, right? So there's A's endowment in the box. All right, so here's part of the genius. So I have the second consumer. Where do you put them? So here where it gets a little creative. So what Edward did one crazy night is Edward put B right up in this corner, which we're not comfortable with. And had B's perspective on the box world the opposite, right? So B kind of looks like this. Bear with me here. Here's B. Right, there's the ground. But since this is a dot cam, look what I can do. Couldn't do this on PowerPoint. So that's B's perspective, right? X axis, Y axis. Pretty good. What's B's endowment? Twenty-five fifty, right? So here it gets better. So twenty-five. So I'm gonna go out twenty-five. Where is it? Only this. So here's A. They've got forty units of X. There's a total of sixty-five available. So if A has 40 units of X, and the only other person in the economy is B, then B must have that distance, right? Which is 65 minus 40 or 25. So this is B's endowment. So in fact, if you go straight up on a vertical line right here, right? This is 25. 
And this right here is x hat e. All right, so you do the same thing with y. So here's a's y. So a has the first 10 units and the remainder in the economy, 60 minus 10, which is 50. Um, that's what p's and out means. <laughs> so this is 50, which is y at b. Okay, so if I plot A's endowment, then implicitly or automatically, I've also plotted Y. B's endowment, my breath sample. And it turns out we're not done yet. What I can do is now I can use the utility functions. So if you take, for example, the endowment, X, A, Y, A hat, which was 4010. We know that if A was to consume her endowment, like not trade, just consume the endowment, they have the utility of 400. Oh, that was the benchmark for A. So XA times YA equals 400 would be the equation for the indifference curve going through A's endowment. This is the indifference curve for A. So if you want to graph this, that's easy, right? This is just a Cobb-Douglas indifference curve, right? So they have the same shapes we've been looking at before, so it looks something like this. Okay, so there's A's indifference curve. Just before we move on, just kind of digest this a little bit. If you look at the box, what's nice about putting the indifference curve in the box is that immediately it becomes apparent which baskets A is interested in, right? And which baskets A is not interested in. That is, if A is going to consider a trade that, say, B proposes to her, A is only going to accept if they wind up in a basket of X and Y that's above that indifference curve. So A is trying to move up in this direction in the box. Okay, so if B proposes something that lands A down here, right, like um, down below the indifference curve, um, A would automatically projected. All right, so where trade is interesting is up above A's indifference curve. So the equation for this line right here is XA times YA equals 400. All right, so it turns out you do the same thing with B, a little bit trickier. I have a lot of experience, so I'm gonna turn this upside down. I'm going to do the same thing for B here. Once it's upside down, I think it's fairly easy. You find uh, B's endowment and put in the indifference curve through the endowment. So sorry, I don't make it make you dizzy here. But let me write this here. So I have X, B, Y, B, which was... So XB times YB has to equal 25 times 50, which was okay. this is my indifference curve for B. All right, we're going to plot that in the same box. So you can spin this around and make it easier. So here's B looking at their world, right? X axis, Y axis. Here's B's endowment, and they just have a difference curve like this. It's the same shape as A's. So X axis, Y axis. So if you graph that, it looks something like this. Okay, there's B's indifference curve. But it's the same shape as A. 
I'm going to label it. When I label it, though, let me turn it around just so we don't have to keep this around. So this is x b times y b equals Okay, so what I have in front of us is I have the endowment for A and B, and I have the difference curves through the endowment for both consumers. As far as gains from trade, right? A wants to be above her indifference curve. Those are the trades that are interesting. B wants to be above his indifference curve. So if this is B's indifference curve, then above B's indifference curve would be where? Out like this way. But the point of the picture being that you can see that it looks like, if I've graphed this correctly, there are allocations inside the box where you can be above both A and B's indifference curve. Not a surprise because we already found some, right? Like, let's remember that one trade we did? What was that one trade we did? 1x for 1y, right? A said, look, I'll give you a unit of x, you give me a unit of y. So A had, instead of 40, they had 39. And 11. So it turns out that's just right here. Uh, this is 39. And this is 11. And so, of course, what that means is this right here is 26. And this right here. I'm going to stop adding things to this picture. This is 49. Okay, so that's why that trade worked a minute ago, because it boosted A and B on no higher indifference curves. So the whole point of this, right, as I said, I needed to introduce sort of a more framework to the model. By that, I just meant I needed to show you guys this. So the edge work box. Point of this was to identify where we get the gains from trade and then see where trade will stop. Where do we have gains from trade? It would just be in this region right here, right? The allocations there are gonna make A's utility higher and B's utility higher. All right, so, <laughs> You can use this picture to kind of get a sense of, um, I said there should be an allocation where trade comes to a stop. I think we called it what the Pareto efficient allocations. Turns out you can actually graph that quite easily. And then once you have the graph, you can sort of see what the math is that, that characterizes. So to show you how that looks, let me just sketch that Edward box one more time here. So a little faster. Is that my X and my Y? The same box. I'm not going to use numbers this time, so I'll just put the same thing we had up a minute ago. So the endowment was like right about here. My difference curves look kind of like this. That was for A. And then for B, it was like this. So U, B. All right, so I'm hoping you can kind of usually sort of see how this is working. You can see where this will wind up. So say we did the one trade, right? And the one trade brought us here. We just talked about that a minute ago. So we have the gains from trade. Once we get to this new basket, you have a new utility and a new utility for A and a new utility for B. 
What you can do is then put the indifference curve in through the new allocation. So A is going to jump to this point, to this point. And once A jumps to this new point, then they're never going to back down from whatever that utility is. Right? So I get a new indifference curve. What does it look like? It's just sort of same shape, right? So it looks like this. A little bit neat. Too bad. So that's A's new indifference curve. No, we won't do this too many times. B's also on a higher indifference curve. So that just looks like this. To be honest, this is where PowerPoint's pretty nice. And I don't have to do this late at night. Now we can keep going and keep going and keep going, but you can see what happened is once we did one trade, right? We did a trade. And this led to these new indifference curves. And once you have those new indifference curves, you can uh, isolate where your gains from trade are. And so what happens is that region there where the next trade's got to take place has got to be in here, right? So above A and above B. Well, what happened is it got smaller, right? So this region that makes A better off and B better off um, sort of narrowed. And so what happens is you keep pushing, eventually you exhaust that. So how is that going to look? So where will trade stop? So I'll show you the last picture of this. So here's how it'll uh, look when it stops. You might even be able to sort of figure it out. What I'm going to do is we're going to go to a new allocation where I'm on a new indifference curve for A. <laughs> and if I try to push A onto a higher indifference curve, the only way you could do it is make B on a lower indifference curve. This is going to be sort of where these two curves kind of touch. So your picture is going to look like this. All right, so just one time sketch here in my same box. And then we can put the map up. X, A, Y, A. No, I'm sorry, X, Y. So here's my endowment. And then my different curves look like this. He was like this. Yeah, so as we keep moving into that gains from trade region, eventually you can get to some point, uh, more or less like say right about here, where I'm on a different script for A that looks like this. And I uh, sort of eliminated all gains from trade. So B's indifference curve has to look just like this. Okay, and so the idea here is uh, to make A better off, you have to go in this region, A better off. relative to that, that second indifference curve for A. And to make B better off, you have to go down here. Pretty nice, huh? So this is where it'll stop. That's a picture of where the trade will stop. Anything A proposes to be that makes A on a higher indifference curve, because these things just touch at that one point and the shape of them, um, will necessarily put B on a lower indifference curve than where they're at now. All right, so this is where my trade will stop. So trade stops here. 
trade stops here. This is an example of a Pareto efficient allocation. All right, so this is one of those Pareto efficient allocations, at least how it looks like uh, from the picture. What is the allocation? It's just some X and Y for A, and it's some X and Y for B. All right, so it's this right here. And then, of course, X, B, Y, B. And what I can do is just write down a few conditions that characterize the picture. So what's going on at that specific allocation in the picture? So there's sort of three main conditions. First of all, if you take the X going to A and you take the X going to B for my allocation, it's sort of like a feasibility condition, they always just have to sum the X bar because that's all there is. So nothing really new there. Same thing for good Y. So if you take the, the Y that A has and you take the Y that B has, that's got a sum of Y bar. Now one and two don't say too much. All that says is that you have a box. So everything inside the box satisfies one and two, right? Pick any basket here, here, here. These are all sort of feasible. Sometimes it's called feasible. The third one, sort of where it has the, the bite. The third one is that notice the indifference curves for A and B at the Pareto efficient allocation are tangent. So like if you look at the difference between, what's the difference between this point and this point? First point, which we call the endowment, uh, the indifference curve for A has a very different uh, slope. The slope of A's indifference curve is, is very different than the slope of B's indifference curve. A's indifference curve, right, at the endowment is fairly flat, right? Just to make up a number, right, it's, well, it should just be y over x, so whatever the endowment is, y over x, you get a sort of a very low number. What's the margin rate of substitution for b? Well, they have a very high y and a very low x. So y over x, the margin rate of substitution is very high, so very steep. What's different about the endowment at this point is that at this point, those two margin rate of substitutions for a and b are exactly equal. So what you write here for three is that y over a, y a x a, which is the margin rate of substitution for a, is got equal to margin rate of substitution. rules out a lot of points, right? For example, one point that this rules out, right? What, what allocation does not satisfy condition? The endowment, right? At the endowment, the indifference curves are not tangent. So if you get an allocation, like maybe Canvas spits out an allocation and says, look at this allocation. And it has some X and some Y for both people. The Canvas question might say, is it Pareto efficient? To check, right, you got to make sure the margin rate substitutions are equal. If they aren't, then it's not Pareto efficient. Just to emphasize, right, take the endowment. Is the endowment Pareto efficient? I said looking at the picture, it isn't, but to confirm, right, you would just see, is the marginal rate of substitution for A equal to the marginal rate of substitution for B? What's the marginal rate of substitution for A? Y over X. What was the endowment for A as far as X and Y? I think those right here. 
Ordinary substitution for A at the endowment. So what does A have as far as X and Y? A has 40 units of X, 10 units of Y. That's what you start with. So this is so Y is, what did I say this? 10. And X is 40. So that's right here. Does 10 over 40 equal, uh, what does Y be? Right here? 50 over 25. 50 over 25? No. Definitely not. All right, so to prove the endowment, it's not Pareto efficient, we're done. Because those are not D equal. So, here's a little bad news. Maybe bad, maybe not, maybe it's good news, I don't know. You tell me, is this good news or bad news? You know what's box? Here's my endowment. I'm not gonna do numbers, let me just sketch it real quick. How many times have I done this to you? Let's see. And then here's B. What's this? X, Y, I down it. The Pareto efficient allocation was right here that I showed you a minute ago. Look like this. And like this. So that allocation satisfies one, two, and three. Turns out it's not the only allocation that satisfies one, two, three. There's lots of them. That is, there's another one right here. That one right there satisfies one, two, three, as long as A's in difference curve looks like this. All right, look at those two. As so long as the marginal rate of substitution are equal and I'm in the box, you satisfy one, two, three. So that's Pareto efficient. There's even a story behind that famous allocation right there. What is it? Imagine you have that younger brother or sister at Halloween, right? And your egg. So this is your indifference curve right here, right? And here's your, your brother or your sister. And you start here. So I start here at the endowment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, can I find an allocation that makes me, that's you, right, as well off as possible that keeps my little sister not worse off. So it's like you have all the bargaining power. So what do you do? You move from this allocation to this allocation. If I go from here to here, A is now on what? Much higher in difference curve. So you made yourself better off. And B is where? Same indifference curve, right? So if B is this endowment, here's the indifference curve. All we did is just put B on the same indifference curve, but over here. So B says, I'm indifferent. But meanwhile, I made A much better off. All right? So sort of like a limit of the bargaining. Of course, your sister, right? She's a lot smarter than you, even though she was younger. Is that true? Maybe she could do it to you, and so it's over here. Right? Is that good news or bad news? They're indifferent. All these points, actually, there's a whole infinite number of them, and these are all Pareto efficient right there. There's a whole bunch of them. Is that good news or bad news? Neutral. All those points satisfy one, two, three. 
it gets worse. There's also points over here where you have a difference curve for A like this and B like this. That's print efficient. And it turns out there's a whole line of them. I don't know if it's linear, but what's the one you see? So all allocations on this line are Pareto efficient. There are points where if for some reason we get to them, trade stops. So if you go from here to here, once you're here, there's going to be no more opportunities from trade. So the gains from trade are, are sort of... Um, they disappear. So as they call this the contract curve. So let me just show you one example of a product efficient allocation, and then I think we can stop for tonight. So let me um, just sketch my box right here. And we'll use the same numbers that we had a minute ago, so we don't have to rebuild all that. We're going to have X and Y. You said that's contract curve? Contract curve, they call it sometimes. Um, also, Pareto efficient allocations, both, both will work. So let me just try to show you one of these um, Pareto efficient allocations, like actual numbers. And then I think we can stop. So here's my endowment. Um, let's see what I have. Forty ten. This was sixty five. I just want to have my numbers in front of me. This was sixty, right? This was uh, fifty. And 25. All right, so just to give you one example, um, this is my endowment. So the endowment is not Pareto efficient. We already did that. Let's do this one, right? Where you, uh, you strong arm that little brother of yours, right? So keep your brother on his original indifference curve, but boost yours as high as possible. All right, so I'm trying to find this right here. So there's uh, some conditions you need to do to find this. So I want to find this proto efficient allocation. Um, at the endowment, If you take your little brother, uh, consumer B there, what I'm going to do is calculate just the uh, equation for the indifference curve for your brother, right? So, because that's where we want to be when we wind up. So, keep them on the same utility. So, the indifference curve for your brother was uh, X B times Y B um, has to equal what? I don't remember what that would be. So B's in difference curve through his endowment. What's A's, what's B's endowment? B has what? 25X and 50Y. So that gave us the utility of 12.50. So this right here is X B Y B equals twelve fifty. Okay, so we got to keep B on the uh, that same indifference curve to get to Pareto efficiency. What I want is the two marginal rate of substitutions to equal one another. So I want marginal rate of marginal rate of substitution for A so Y over X A to equal the marginal rate of substitution for B. That, that'll be my Pareto efficient. That'll put me on B's indifference curve, your brother's indifference curve, and now we're just going to equate the marginal rate of substitution. So that'll bounce me from there to there. Okay, so 
to there. Problem is here I have two equations, but, but four unknowns. So here you have two equations, four unknowns, which isn't good. So there's a little trick. What I can do is note that YA, YA I can write a different way. Um, the total amount of Y in the economy is what? Y bar. 60. Y bar, right? 60, exactly. So YA I could write out is equivalent to saying 60 minus YB. Right, so take the total amount of Y, take out Bs, and that's got to be A's, right? So this right here is just going to be Y bar minus um, YB. I could do the same thing down here with XA. XA has got to be X bar minus XB. So this is X bar minus XB. So Y bar is 60. And X bar is 65. So now what I have is I have this equation and this equation. So this is equation one. And this is equation two. And what's the good news? Two equations, two unknowns. X, B, Y, B are my unknowns. So we can cross multiply this right here, simplify. So I get 60 X, B minus X, B, Y, B equals 65 Y, B minus X, B, Y, B. Does that look good? Notice on the left side and the right side, you have an X, B, Y, B. So that'll cancel. So I have 60 X, B equals 65 Y, B. Or if I solve for Y, B, Y, B equals 60 divided by 65. What did I say? 60 divided by 65. 0 0.923. Good enough. So it gets this late at night. It's nice to use decimals. So I just solve for y in terms of x, and I'm going to substitute that into this first equation. So I'll take this. Put this. So I have XB times YB, and YB is 0.923 XB equals 1250. Almost there. So 1250 divided by 0.923. Is like one three five four. And I'm going to take the square root of that. Which is 36.8. Then you can, of course, do the rest of this. So uh, YB equals 0.923 times that. So 30, let me make that just 34 round. So XA is going to be X bar minus X. B, so 65 minus X minus
point of view two, and ya is point of view y bar minus yb. Y bar is 60, and YB we just got is 34. So what's that? 26. So let me just put that in my picture here. So X is 28.2. There's 28.2. And Y is 26, like a scale. Okay, so you could, you could actually calculate, uh, the point of this was you can actually calculate the exact numbers for the Pareto efficient allocation. Right. All right, so the next thing we got to do um, is, once we have an idea of what's Pareto efficient and what isn't, now we're going to add prices to the economy and see what happens if prices are guiding decisions instead of barter. I'll just give it away, like spoiler. Turns out the prices, when they guide people's behavior, they act like, uh, anybody know what they act like? It's as if a invisible hand is guiding all the selfish behavior to a Pareto efficient allocation which was first talked about by who? Did you read that book? Adam Smith. Adam Smith. He coined that sort of term. So this is sort of a way of trying to capture what Adam Smith was talking about. So a decentralized economy, prices will turn out guide, be, guide behavior to these spread efficient allocations. So sort of the celebration of capitalism. All right, so like uh, last time, I'll post a video tomorrow 